I don't know, walking around a pond in circles over and over again, unable to escape, kind of panicking, not sure how you're ever going to get home. I kind of call that Tuesday. I, I find myself walking around and forget where the hell I am all the time. But in today's film, it's a little scarier than that. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, we have a fun one for you today. The film is Brightwood. It is available on VOD and DVD right now. It is a total independent film, as you are going to hear. And we have writer-director Dane L. Carr with us for the Q&A. Now, aside from the film being good, and you should definitely seek it out and check it out and support independent cinema, this is a total DIY-styled podcast in which, as you're going to hear, Dane made this movie for a very low price, and he did it in the typical low-budget horror style. He had two actors, he had one location, it was outdoors in daylight, which is not typical horror style, but uh, he certainly made it kind of scary and creepy and weird, like a good Twilight Zone. And Dane was very forthcoming about his creative process and what everything costs and how difficult it is to release a film these days. There's a lot of great stuff in here, folks, so I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, this is the place where I always promote Backstory Magazine, which I'm still going to do because we have an announcement. We've released issue 49.5, but I would be remiss if I did not mention the ongoing WGA and SAG after strike. As I'm sure you know, we're in the midst of a historic strike where writers and and actors have joined together on the picket lines to demand fair pay and better working conditions, which really isn't a lot to ask. So I hope you will support the WGA and SAG-AFTRA. You could join them on the picket lines here in Los Angeles if you happen to be in LA or New York, or you could go online to the WGA and SAG-AFTRA site and you could find out how you could help them from really anywhere in the world which I hope you do. Now, there's certain rules about what kind of interview can be conducted with a writer during the strike. And I just want you to know that Backstory Magazine and this podcast are in compliance with the WGA guidelines. So even today, Dane L. Carr is a writer director, but we pretty much lean more into the directing with, yeah, a few writing questions, but we're leaning into the directing, even though he's pre-WGA, we're, we're sticking out of the territory that the WGA has requested folks not to delve into as much. Now, when you apply those same rules to Backstory Magazine, it's put us in an interesting position because we love interviewing screenwriters. So issue 49.5, our new issue, which just came out this week, it includes every single thing that we have published since our Oscar issue, which is a lot. That's everything from Across the Spider-Verse to Elemental to a whole bunch of TV and other movies. And uh, it also includes Emmy coverage. And our Emmy coverage is pretty cool because it has everything from The Mandalorian, Ted Lasso, Obi-Wan. Kenobi, The Bear, Better Call Saul, Weird, The Al Yankovic Story, and Prey. But in each of those interviews where screenwriters were involved, those were done pre-strike. And in the interviews that we did during the strike, those are with other storytellers, which are directors, editors, and cinematographers. So that's the way that we have decided to cover the Emmys, to do it per everyone's guidelines and comfort levels, but to still involve the other crew members who themselves are also storytellers and who are always interviewed in Backstory Magazine as well during the award season. So it was a good fit. And this is a great issue. Even though it's called 49.5, it is an absolutely full issue. But I've decided to basically delay issue 50 until the strike's over, I think, because I don't know, how would we do this without screenwriters? Screenwriters are our passion. Writing is our passion. So we want to give you the robust issue 50 that you all deserve and that we're excited to publish, but we really can't start doing interviews for it until the strike is over. So in the coming weeks, hopefully not months, but you and I both know the strike could go longer than people want it to, we will continue to update issue 49.5 with new releases, new movies, new TV shows, with whoever we could interview properly without stepping on any toes and following all the guidelines. So back Backstory subscribers, you should just check back on our website. We'll be making announcements there as we put new articles into issue 49.5. And speaking of Backstory, if you're not yet a subscriber, obviously you could test drive us by reading our free issue on a desktop or laptop at Backstory.net or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, there's a lot to check out in the current issue. You could also see our current table of contents there, and you have access to our entire archive. So now is a fantastic time to support independent journalism, which I hope you'll do. And to sweeten the deal, I'm going to give you discount coupon code SAVE5. 
That's save and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot for me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom interviews go, so you could actually see us talking if you'd like. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. And as I said a moment ago, it is Emmy voting season. You could vote today. We're still in the midst of the open voting. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, The Daily Show. And just to remind all of our Emmy voting listeners out there, you know, for your consideration, please keep in mind that The Daily Show is the show the New York Times called, quote, a beloved institution, and it's nominated for three Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Talk Series. Host Trevor Noah helped us make sense and laugh at a nonsensical and not-so-fun world, and he did it every single night, four nights a week, 52 weeks a year, except when he didn't because of holidays and stuff. The Washington Post called Trevor, quote, a late-night comedy unicorn, and we all know how rare unicorns are. They're pretty much extinct. So he didn't do it for the awards, but come on. If you're still not convinced, you can learn more about The Daily Show over at ParamountFYC.com. That's ParamountFYC.com. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with writer-director Dane L. Carr about his debut feature film, Brightwood, which is streaming VOD and on DVD. So I hope you'll support independent cinema and check it out. Okay, Dane, it's good to have you. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. So we'll start where we usually do in a second about learning more about you. But because the strike is going on right now with WGA Mm -hmm. and SAG-AFTRA, I think that is a good place to start. And because you're pre-WGA, I would guess, because this is your first film, what are your views on the strike? Great great way to start. I'm 100% for the strike. I think this is an incredible time uh, to kind of stand our ground. We're up against kind of these, you know, it's not studios of old. They're kind of these mega corporations. And if we really want kind of fair compensation in the future, it's kind of now, now's the time. I think it's kind of now or never. Now in that situation and having a, a small independent film coming out. Of course, my actors aren't able to help promote. We've been talking to SAG and hopefully we'll get an interim agreement. I do think during this time, it is important to celebrate independent cinema, especially movies so small that have no connection, you know, whatsoever to the AMPTP and keep that part of the industry going and alive and celebrating it. Was there a way that you could have done this with a WGA waiver? Was that something you looked into? I know your actors are SAG. It was a SAG film, but the I was never in the I wasn't in the WGA yet. I consider myself pre-WGA, so as soon as I'm eligible, I will join. But this script was not in the the union. Well, yeah. okay. I want to give people a baseline on who you are and from whence dost thou hell. So sure. you were telling me right before I hit the record button that you are an LA native and yes. now an East Coast transplant. Tell us yeah. about where you grew up and how you kind of got the the filmmaking bug. I know that you have a deep family connection mm-hmm. with Dana Elkar. So tell me about growing up with a father who was an actor. I was born in San Fernando Valley, but I grew up in Ventura County in a in a small city called Santa Paula, which is a small kind of agriculture, a lot of lemons. And my father, who was an actor, he did this incredible thing. He was a bit he was a real theater guy, and everywhere he lived he seemed to start a theater. So he started a theater in Santa Paula called the Santa Paula Theater Center, which was a a 99 seat professional theater. Most of my childhood memories are growing up running around the, you know, the seats and playing with props and getting into trouble. And so I I quite literally grew up in theater, clearly seeped in. (laughs) Yeah, obviously having him as an actor in your life, were there ever great stories that he told you about some of the bigger films he was on? Like, I know that he was in The Sting in 2010. He always had great stories stories. 2010 was a an interesting one. And we actually just, in relation to my movie, Brightwood, we premiered at uh, Other World's Film Festival in Austin. And at that festival, completely unbeknownst to the programmers, they had also programmed a 35 millimeter uh, screening of 2010, the year we made contact. Yeah. So here I am premiering my film and at the same festival a few days before I get to watch my dad on the big screen on 35 millimeter for, for actually the first time. 
because I'd never seen him in a theater. Wow. And so that was quite a fun experience. One thing that was interesting about your father, if, if my research is correct, is that he became legally blind. And yeah, when I was seven. Right. And he continued acting. He, he made some appearances. Like I know there was a law and order and some other stuff. Mm-hmm. And what, what did you learn about, about that? Because that's very rare. It was such a huge transition for him and for the family. And it was very hard having such a passion and love of not only theater, but also films and, and acting. I think he really felt like this was it. And I, as a seven-year-old, uh, I, I couldn't really understand the kind of pain that was happening. However, what ended up happening is our relationship ended up being quite close. I kind of became his eyes. For a majority of my youth, we would go around, I would read to him scripts. It ended up being, luckily, that he was able to finish MacGyver. And then he would do some theater and he did some shows. I remember I took him, he was in an episode of ER and I drove him down and you know I was helping him with his lines and so. So it was a very close relationship. And then also at a very young age, he still loved going to movies. And so we would go to old, uh, early shows, early screenings, and I would sit next to him. Hopefully the theater would be pretty empty. And I would start describing the visual parts of the film to see like what what are the basic things that I need to say so that he understands a scene. And we would do this. And I, you know, at first I would start, I was not very good at it. And I got better and better until I just kind of knew there was almost like a language between us. Oh, this is what I need to to say just so he could get the gist of what's going on. I mean, I can't place it specifically, but that certainly, obviously, I think has <laughs> affected my um, my love and 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 uh, desire to screenwrite. A lot of people look at movies passively, and so you doing that as 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 a kid really made you have to kind of examine and be able to explain in bare bones terms, which is yeah. you know analyzing from a very early age. I, I guess what was the most confusing movie to translate like that? The one that really stumped you or. Or, oh. or actually just cracked him up because the movie was so absurd he couldn't well, believe what you were telling him. I mean, I remember, gosh, I remember anything where there was a lot of stuff going on for a long period of time where there's no dialogue, where you're, you know, you're just talking. I remember yeah. thinking, I think I we watched like the Thin Blue Line, line the Terrence Malick movie. And like after a while, you're like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Yeah, stuff's happening. And I love that movie, but it, it it's very hard to kind of describe, you know, now there's a bird in the tree. That can be difficult, but it seems like it was a good experience that resonated. So did you study screenwriting and directing or filmmaking anywhere? Was that something that you went to college for or was it something- uh, just kept as a hobby. No, I never, I never did any, I took some filmmaking classes in New York, but uh, I never, I never studied. I never went to film school. I just kind of started uh, at an early age with video cameras, kind of experimenting with things. I was really into like makeup, gory makeup for a while. So that was big. And then that progressed, but I've always kind of been writing and um, uh, working on on scripts for years and then taking odd jobs as editors and as an editor and a colorist. And all of that. So editing was something that you kind of did early on to pay the bills? Editing a short, a lot of short films. What kind yeah. of colorist activities were you doing? DaVinci Resolve, just kind of teaching myself uh, color. And then I ended up just being able to kind of do it. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't love doing that though. It's very, uh, it's not the funnest thing. I love editing. I love filming, but the, the colors can be quite annoying. Well, so I'm curious what gave you the idea for this i mean i i know that you had done some short films and you did there's three of them that i came across there's the pond in 2017 the saddler's son and oak in 2020 saddler's mm-hmm. son was 2018 the pond from the description that i read of an addict who gets trapped out by a pond kind of yeah. seems like that might have contained some of the seeds of the idea. For oh, Bright- yeah. No, this Brightwood came from the pond. And okay, the pond, okay. I first started getting, I mean, I don't know where the idea actually came from, but I, I remember just having these visions of somebody getting trapped, going around in circles. And at the time, my daughter was, I think, two or three at the time. And so one thing I would do is I would take our jogger and I'd go for a jog. And in our neighborhood, there was this kind of little pond that seemed, once you were inside, it, you really felt like you were in nature so it was great and I would jog around and I also you know I love photography and I would take photographs and I would watch the light and you start to kind of see how things change where it's something could be very pretty and then with the right shadows it can become very sinister and it suddenly hit me well if I was going to do take this story of someone getting trapped going around in circles why don't I just do it here at this location I know it well and just for practical purposes I can use this and so I just got a, a co-worker of mine and we went out and we 
filmed it. Very basic story, very little few. There's no dialogue in it, really. But it, it ended up being kind of the ex- an experiment to see if I could get the structure of the plot to work, if I could visually tell the story of going around in circles, if I could make that entertaining, if I could have some humor in it. And then the entire time I was doing that and finishing that film, it suddenly hit me, oh, well, what if you put a couple into this situation? And what what if they were right about, what if they were right on the verge of divorce? And then just kind of, what, what would that be like? And that idea percolated for a very long time before I started writing it. So what were your big kind of lessons that you learned on the pond and, and Sadler's son and Oak? One thing that I started to realize is that Sadler's son was years before the pandemic. But what I what I wanted to do was I wanted to really dab into cinematography. And so that was very much a, you know, I was dealing with one space and I how how could I, uh, you know, light that room? And I was kind of teaching myself how to do that and working with a camera and working with different lenses. And so that was my first kind of into that world. Brightwood was very much about m- movement and just basic storytelling. Like I said, no dialogue. And and I just wanted to, it was, it was just kind of an experiment to see if I could do it, get away with it. And some festivals took it and it was great. And it started this kind of conversation with actors. So it was so important to kind of take these leaps and make this stuff, even if it was just shot on an iPhone, because then suddenly, you know, my very good, I've known Max Wartendike for years, who's the lead actor and uh, pro- producer of Brightwood, he played Dan, but then we started talking, okay, well, what's the next project we could work on? And all of this stuff was just kind of this snowball effect from these short films that I would make. At the time, Max and I had been developing another script quite extensively and we're having meetings. And then, of course, the pandemic did did uh, happen and that kind of fell apart. What could you tell us about the other script? Uh, we're, I mean, we're still we're still hoping to kind of make it. It's a, it's a real Hitchcockian thriller. It's a real fun piece. It's called Drive by Night. Hopefully we'll get back to that. But um, obviously, we're all kind of on pause with the uh, with the strikes going on. So that kind of fell apart. And then the drive to see a feature film made was so strong. You know, I'm getting older. I wanted to actually do it. So if I was going to do this, what story could I tell under the circumstances? I needed something that had limited crew, you know, just a couple actors and a, and a single location. Well, here's this idea I, I did a few years ago. And so I started writing that with the budget in mind. And that's kind of how it came about. And then I, I shared that first couple of drafts with Max. He really responded to it. And then he got me in touch with Dana Berger. They had worked together before. And then it kind of started. And then it was really, it became a process of just learning how to make a film, teaching myself how to actually, how I was going to film it because I was going to take on a lot of jobs. Yeah. You were a cinematographer, you were also editor, and and we're going to talk about that later. A lot of that'll kind of come out in the spoiler section, but that's, that's kind of what I think is the fun of this episode is yeah. that you kind of were teaching yourself how to make a first film and yeah. you, did a, you did a really good job of it. So, oh, so I mean, like how long did it take you to write the script, your production draft that you eventually so, had, and how many pages was it? The first two drafts were pretty long, and I did an unusual thing with the script. And I, you know, I grew up in the whole industry. I know that it, this kind of thing is very rare, especially with filmmaking. But after about the, I want to say the second or third draft, this was still during COVID, and so what I did is I invited Max and Dana on these Zoom conversations, starting probably four months before our shoot date, and I would just have them read. And then I would rewrite and I would have them read and we'd have a conversation and then I would rewrite. And this process was almost more like theater in the sense that the rehearsals became so much about how, I, you know, about me distilling down the language and distilling down the text. The basic plots were there. But to have this conversation of, well, what if I said it like this? Or well, I knew that I didn't want to have that conversation in the woods in 80 degree weather on a very tight schedule. So I just wanted to do it here. And so their collaboration in this way really helped hone down the script. I mean, I, I think the last script was in the 85 pages, maybe. And what was uh, your longest? Oh, it was 105 or 106. Okay, that's that that long. I write very practically. Once I start getting into the 80s, I'm like, okay, what do I got to do to kind of sum this thing up? Because people aren't going to really read it. That's fair enough. I mean, it sounds like you were essentially workshopping it by having a close relationship with your actors, something that, you know, works for an independent film, of course. You yeah. can do these kind of staged readings, even on yeah. Zoom or whatever, just to hear it out loud. So yeah. that seems like definitely a good process. Well, um, I wanted them to be very comfortable in what they were saying, uh, you know, yeah. and I wanted it to sound like they were actually saying it as, as, as much as possible. For folks that haven't yet seen the movie, and obviously please watch the trailer, but, you know, Brightwood is a Twilight Zone styled film 
about a couple, as you just said, who's on the verge of divorce, and they go out for a jog by a pond, and then they find themselves trapped in the woods. The The trail that they walked in to get to the pond has disappeared, and they're surrounded by thick forestry everywhere, and all they could do is a loop around the pond, and then strange things start to happen. <laughs> so, I mean, it's 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 a cool film, and I love low-budget sci-fi or low-budget horror, however you want to classify this, mm. because you're stuck on the idea. It's not so much your special effects. It's it's the idea, the story, the characters, and that's why I likened it to, like, a good Twilight Zone, because, you know, Twilight Zone is a very amazing television show. It's oh, yeah. been, been recreated many times, but at its core... It's great character stuff because not every episode, even of the original Twilight Zone, had the budget for the amazing special effects. So sure. some of them were just greatly done concepts with fantastic actors. And so I'm curious, once you were shooting it, I just want to talk production for a couple of minutes. What kind of COVID mitigations did you need to take? Because obviously on the bigger films, to be able to get through their shoot schedules, to mm -hmm. not have people out sick, you know, very sophisticated, but simple to follow guidelines have been en enacted ranging from masking to different pod cells to who's unmasked when the actors are unmasked, etc. Obviously, you're shooting outdoors, which is which is going to help you as well. What were some of the things you did, if anything, during your shoot and how long was your shoot to be able to have an uninterrupted shoot from COVID? We followed everything to that. We were a SAG. Uh, we were under a SAG contract. We, we started it as a micro budget uh, SAG contract. And that was always under the idea that we would upgrade that to an ultra low budget contract. And so my producer, Max Wartendike, um, and I really, really took the time. It's, it's such a different time now. It's incredible that we did all this, but really went, followed all of the rules to a T. We had to test, I think, three days a week. We had to do yeah, the PCR nasal testing. I remember doing that. We had a uh, COVID compliance officer. Really? Oh, you had a COVID compliance officer? Oh, we, a, we, a, what what we did, small. our way around it is that my assistant and DP and key grip, Andrew Clark, you know, went out and got the got the credential to do that. And so that, that wow. he was able to do that. And then he took our temperatures every morning. And I really wanted wanted to really be careful and tight on that. I know I've no other independent films kind of weren't as strongly on board with all of it, but um, I, because I just knew the goal was to upgrade and we wanted to have distribution and I didn't want to do anything that might disrupt that. But it, it's a trip thinking about it now because we were doing that on top of, you know, just having this in, insane shoot in the middle of the woods. We shot for 12 out of 16 days in Rockaway, New Jersey at a lake called Egbert Lake. Great little community. So we 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 really we were doing pretty good with it. We all did. I will say that we all kind of in terms of zones, we all lived in the in the same Airbnb that we were renting nearby. So we were all kind of zoned together. Kind of like a pod, basically. Yeah, like thinking. basically. Yeah. OK. I mean, look, they're still doing this. You know, testing yeah. is still a thing because it's too expensive to go down when you're in production. And sure. so yeah. most of these guidelines are still actually in place right right now as we're coming into the fall. You know, we're, we're talking in August. You know, there's a there's a new wave surging right now. So, yeah, it, it, it makes sense. So you said 12 of the 16 days were there days shot somewhere else? No, just uh, days off. Those okay, were so we okay. shot for 12 days, but it was 16. It was a 16 day total shoot, I, I guess. But so you only shot for 12 days to get this in the can. Yeah. That that's amazing. Well, so you're you're the cinematographer here. How many cameras did you use, and what kind of camera was it? I used a, a Sony Alpha DSLR mirrorless camera, um, something that I was very comfortable with because I had shot some videos with. I also knew that it was very lightweight. One of the things that was very practical about the script, which I learned from the pond, was that I said, "Well, oh, I'm going to just set the entire thing during the daylight." So that really freed me up just on a practical level uh, as a as a dp because i wasn't going to have to have a lot of lights now that also meant there's the potentiality of having less control of shadows and sun because uh, of the, the constant changing. So I had to uh, be thinking constantly about that and how that might affect the shots but it's, i experimented with a lot of different lenses. I couldn't afford, you know, super nice lenses so i uh, found these kind of Rokinon cinema lenses. And then I I had one lens, an old, like 50-year-old antique Mamiya lens that I would use on my close-ups. It was beautiful. And then in terms of the pre just filming it, I had experimented with 
using a, an electric gimbal. I didn't really like it. So what I did is I got kind of like a cheaper version of a steady cam and I taught myself how to use a steady cam. And that gave me a bit more control to kind of dance with the actors because you can really just tap it if you need to. And yeah, I remember my neighbors must, neighbors must have thought I was crazy because I would just be jogging around my neighborhood with a steady cam on practicing. Well, so you uh, said a cheaper it, version right? of a steady cam. What was it? Oh God, I think it's called like a free cam, uh, something like that. It's but not it, a glove. But it worked pretty well? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. It was like 350 bucks. It worked fine. You just have oh. to get the weights right and everything. One of the things about shooting outdoors is that if you're not careful in your exposure, Sometimes you get that nuclear blowout of the sun. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Overall, you didn't have that. And I'm just curious how you compensated for that. Because sometimes it could just be stopping it down. Sometimes it could be lighting your actors. Because like when they get off the path yeah. and they're away from most of the light and they're in the forest, I would guess to avoid some of the crazy shadows, you really needed to bounce some light on. This. I did. I had a I had a bounce board. I had some diffusion. We could set it up. I had one or two lights in case I needed to just get some stuff on their face and in their eyes. And how are you powering? those out in the woods batteries i would charge batteries like crazy every night we'd have a pack of like 16 or we i don't know how many batteries we had we would take them out with us every day but yeah i was always watching the levels i was always taking readings just to try to make sure that they were exposed enough and one thing that i also learned from the pond as well during the pond it was a total mistake uh here are just happy accident here uh, i did it on purpose which was we shot in may and so on the east coast being a Southern California and having no idea what seasons are here, all the trees lose their leaves. And so the whole winter happened. The first time I actually saw this location, it was covered in snow. So, you know, winter, we decided to shoot here. I thought it would work. And so then I'm just watching the leaves. But the great thing about the kind of April, May time is that the leaves are growing, but New Jersey is almost like a jungle. It's the foliage is very thick, but around that time they're, they're grow, they grow enough just so uh, it, it covers the trees, but not enough to, stop all the sun from coming into the canopy, you know, coming down through the canopy. So I could go into the woods and it seemed like they were in the woods, but sun was still coming down and there were shadows. But if I had shot maybe like a month later, I would have, have had to light them in the woods. Because it would have been too dense. Yeah. Got it. So you shot in May. What year, what year did you shoot? 2021. So two actors, one location, that's the classic independent film setup. What was the budget? If you're able to say what was what was your budget? You know, you said you started micro and you were going to low budget with the SAG waiver. Yep. What did you get it all done for? I'm happy to say it. now that the, the now that we're sold and it's going to be out. When we started the first day of production with the actors, we had about seven thousand dollars in the bank. I had spent money. Uh, obviously, that is definitely micro, my friend. Good yeah. for you. And then the completed budget at, by the end was about fourteen thousand dollars. What really fourteen thousand dollars? Including editing. Yeah, because I edited it. Well, right, because because yeah. most, of the labor, most of the labor was you. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Obviously, you recouped your costs, sir. Uh, that, yeah. that 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 one was easy to do. Was your sale ever reported? Uh, no, no, okay. no, no. And we're we're still working on stuff. And we have a sales rep who's working in foreign sales for us Great. now too. But um, yeah, that's the that's the that's the initial budget. You know, I mean, I pulled a lot of favors. There were a lot of people that were helping me out, but it ended up being kind of. Incredible. I just actually listened to a podcast this morning, uh, which was a great podcast, but they thought that it was about a $350,000 movie and I was kind of laughing. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, I mean, like having a small crew, being able to do it yourself. I mean, it's only sustainable for your first couple movies because yeah. then, you know, the hope is that like, look, this is why we're striking. The hope is that everybody gets a reasonable wage later. Uh, yeah. And I'm guessing with SAG, the way it works is a deferred payment structure. Right. So well, the micro the micro budget agreement allowed me to as a producer on the film as well, allowed me to hire SAG actors and then I could make a deal with them in terms of paying them either later or whatever it was open to. And it, as long as they were OK with it, and as long as SAG was OK with it. So that was a great gift that happened, I think, in December of 2020. They just started that. So as soon as I saw that contract, I it really opened up a door for me to say, oh, well, I can do that. I can actually do this and I can use Max, who I've known for years. And then again, like I said before, always with the idea that we were going to upgrade because you can't you can't have distribution under micro 
budget contract. And you so have when to you upgraded, it. it was just, even though you still were probably at a micro budget level, you just agreed to the higher guidelines and payment structures that were needed for the upgrade. Right. In fact, this is just happening right now. So yes, the budget of the, of the film was $14,000, but I just recently, because we just recently upgraded through SAG. So that adds on another five or $6,000 that I had to pay out. And luckily we were give we got that much through our distribution and everything. So you got probably more than 5,000, I would yeah, guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. I mean, like it's, it's a good structure and like, there is a secretive part of it that a lot of filmmakers don't talk about because as you just said, a podcast thought you did it for 350. It's mm-hmm. like a double-edged sword a little, because basically you want to probably do another low budget like that. But at the same time, if too many distributors know how low you made it, they're going to give you low ball offers for their their pricing. (laughs) I mean, yes. Uh, Ray at Cinephobia releasing is is a really good guy. And I'm happy that we kind of found him and he liked the movie and we kind of all took a chance together because he has a new company coming out, Cinephobia releasing. You know, there's a lot of distributors out there that really do border on scams. Really, to tell you the truth, and this is again why... I, I, we support the strike so much is that when Max and I started five years ago working to try to get a movie made, we had this fundamental question. And the question was, how's anybody making money in independent movies? Like how you, how can you make, you know, a $300,000 movie or a million dollar movie and then sell it for $6,000 to a distributor on a 50, 50 deal. You know, the, the, the whole thing seems so backwards in some ways, because it used to be, obviously you could, you know, find a distributor and have a kind of thought a small theatrical run and then you'd go through uh, you know a dvd or something like that so the god's honest truth is you now five six years later having gone through this whole process of distribute distributing a film you can make money through foreign sales the reality is a lot of these major films are not they're still in the red they're not making money and they won't and that that type of system can only last so long until it all comes crumbling down which is what we're kind of seeing for years it's been stated the problem with what used to be referred to as the sundance release schedule of like you know make something for 500 sell it at sundance for a million then yeah. the studio has to do prints and advertising and right. you know right, right. at least often like that was a big negotiating part of the deal of how much they were going to spend on pna right and yeah, you know, PNA still exists, obviously, even in the world of streaming, because if you're going to do a theatrical release, you need to get those DCP drives sent out. So, That's, yes, yeah, it's cheaper it's awesome. and more efficient than, you know, 35. But the advertising part is a big part of it because we have just stacks of media now and in a good way. Like it's it's nice for consumers. It's nice for people to watch. Right. But for filmmakers, being that needle in a haystack can be really frustrating. And so the advertising part and the marketing part of this is still kind of important. And you're right that there's a lot of movies that if their spend is too high, they can't recoup the cost. And as you said, a lot of these deals, at least in the lower kind of levels for smaller films, become a 50 50 split with your distributor the quandary is 50 50 of what well it's not it's not just those you're out yeah yeah but but that it's not it's not just that that it's the 50 50 deal with your distributor who maybe has a marketing fee of say like 10k or whatever they're going to put on it who knows but it's like the fact that you're actually going to actually see any of that money back yeah or they'll figure out some way of saying oh well we had to market it more here it's that classic you know right uh, distribution tale so you never actually see any money so you've you've just made a three hundred thousand dollar movie and got five thousand dollars i did not realize some of the distribution deals were five thousand dollars that's oh yeah that's anywhere between five and 60k if it's a big streaming ser- service they might do a buyout that's obviously in the hundreds or something but uh it's pretty pretty wacky out there kids <laughs> that, that, that is crazy that is crazy yeah. well so did you use one camera or did you use two when you were shooting one camera i had a backup camera but just one camera everything was you know changed we would change the setups but because i had no lights the setups were very fast so i didn't really have to do anything major reproduction is really important for a director it's a place to get all your ducks in a row what were some of the things other than workshopping your script that were important in pre-production. Max and I really knew that in order to make this work, that we would have to plan everything out to a T. So he he started a breakdown in a schedule. I started working on a shot list, a very extensive shot list. And we kind of just combined these things so that we had the timing of the days down to how long it would take to change a lens. Everything was just 
completely planned out. I had this giant Bible because Max is also an actor in the film. So once we were started filming, I needed him to be an actor and to focus on acting. And so my assistant and I could just go through this Bible and just be like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is how long it's going to take. We planned, and I'm I'm talking about this. I love Max, but we we planned so much. I mean, I'm talking I like 12 o'clock at night, eye rolling, like, do we really need to do this? But we planned it out so, so much that by the second day of actual photography on principle of photography, I started started realizing that we were going faster and, and we were we were going to hit we were finishing scenes faster than we thought and so it allowed me I suddenly could say hey let's take a break and let's do this let's do a couple more takes let's play a little so it's a very good example of planning really actually working and allowing us to have a lot more freedom on set because usually it is the exact opposite of that that you find you're rushing and you have no time for a type of shoot you know like ours it'd be very typical of a director to say you know three four takes and then we got to move and so this allowed me to kind of go okay well let's do six eight ten let's try to find the real what's really working so that you know the, the pre-production on this was extensive but also great and it, and it helped us out quite a bit did you have an extended rehearsal period we only rehearsed in zoom and then we did not rehearse on the actual location at all so then it was just doing the scenes. Well, look, this is the point in which we've reached where we could really not talk non-spoilery any longer. Hey, get out of here. Go watch the movie. <laughs> so, folks, it is on VOD. You could watch Brightwood on VOD. You could also buy DVD Blu-ray of it, I believe. It's no, on- no Blu-ray yet, but I okay. think something's going to work. So DVD, right. uh, great extra. You could also watch a DVD of it. So <laughs> press pause if you don't want spoilers right now. Go watch it on DVD. Go watch it on streaming, however you want. It is a complicated film. If you're a fan of time crimes, which we're going to talk about in a moment and stuff like that, you'll you'll be digging this movie. Go watch the trailer. Go watch it to support independent film. And then come back and hear the rest of the conversation because you have been warned. We are now getting into the spoiler section. So, you know, one of the ways that some people have referred to this movie is that it seems possibly influenced by time crimes. I was thinking of The Endless by Benson and Moorhead, which, which actually came out coincidentally the same year that The Pond was made by you. And so I'm curious, like, what kind of influence those films films had on Brightwood and what some of your other influences might have been. I mean, I love uh, The Endless and I love Time Crimes. Those films, I, I think I actually watched The Endless not that long ago, so uh, a few years ago. They didn't have any direct influence any more so than, say, like, I, I love Twilight Zone and I thought it kind of seemed like a Twilight Zone episode. What I found early on, just thinking about it and having done The Pond and some having someone being trapped is very organically, I just started thinking about the couple and that I didn't have any strong answers, but I I knew that there could be the possibility of a metaphor there for a relationships and going around in circles and going in and out of toxicity. I didn't have the full the story fully fleshed out, but I felt like something could really be there. So then when I started writing it, again, it was just take this couple. I knew the game. I knew what was going to happen. I knew the ending of the movie completely. So it was just take this kind of out-of-towners, like zany couple, throw them into this mix and just might let my brain kind of go. And I had this fun it was very fun to write the script because it was very fast and just kind of throwing it, throwing them into these strange situations. And that's really kind of how it came out. So there was no direct influence by any of those films other than they were maybe somewhere in the back of my head subconsciously. That's cool. The big spoiler here is, you know, Dan and Jen are getting killed by, mm-hmm. you know, a mysterious hoodie person. Yeah. And the the big reveal is we later learn that this is a future version of each of them, actually. Yeah. Killing their other selves, uh, mm. essentially for food, yeah. um, because being trapped in a pond for a very long time with no other food, yeah. yes, yes, it would turn you to cannibalism. And <laughs> that's that's the loop that they're in. Yeah. As you said, it like it tries the relationship. It obviously metaphorically has some sense of their relationship because as they're trying to repair it, they are cannibalizing their earlier memories of what brought them together and what they actually like about each other. So that works as well. When did you kind of come up with that idea that the mystery hoodie person was actually going to be just later versions of them cannibalizing their younger selves? That's in the pond. So that was part of the whole structure of that as well. However, the complexities of 
having it be a couple and having it be, you know, this kind of idea of, I knew I wanted the film to start out where they kind of hate each other. And then it kind of goes into the cycle where they're kind of like, at least they, the acknowledgement of them loving each other. But, you know, it's, it's in simplistic enough as, you know, going around and around in circles, devouring yourselves or that the, the, the thing that is allowing the relationship to continue is consuming your partner literally consuming your partner so that it can actually keep going. I made that I manifested that into an actual situation in the movie. But that's the beauty of the kind of that time warp scenario is that I get to kind of play that out in a realistic term to, to an individual or an audience member. They clearly have never been stuck in a time loop or a time warp, but we all kind of seem to know what that feels like. And to be stuck with someone that you're kind of over, and you don't want to be with them anymore. I mean, these are all things that we go through. We kind of know what it feels like, even though it's a physical impossibility of being stuck in time. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, un unless I go back to my first page and start repeating all my questions again, and we could be in yeah. right now. Yeah, of course. But, but I won't do that to you. I won't do that to our listeners. But it totally works. And I'm curious, like, was it always going to be them just because that's the way it was also in the pond? I love hearing about left turns. And I know mm -hmm. during the WGA strike, obviously, I'm asking you more directing questions out of respect to the policies that they've seem to implement, even though there seems to be a bit of confusion, because I've seen some very big pieces where people get deep into the writing. I'm going to dip my toes in just a little here, but not too much. But was there ever a time where you considered an, a third party where it wasn't them? Never a third actor, but I will say there was a time because <laughs> I, you, did you ever watch Zardos? Remember sure. Zardos? Yeah. That ending? There was a time where I was like, oh, and then a kid runs out <laughs> and they have a little kid at the end. Oh, but I, I didn't do that. No, a little cannibal kid in the woods, a, little cannibal kid. a feral <laughs> child would have been just oh, amazing just devouring other versions of, the, of his parents. So I love that. That's great. Is there anything else in, in kind of like your left turn zone of like a, another wild idea that you toyed with that was either too complicated or I mean, uh, afford, you know, it's arguably some people like it, some people don't. But one of the big decisions I made early on in terms of just the writing and the structure is that I had done a draft where the mechanics of what is going on in terms of the time loop or paradox, I don't know. I dived a little bit deeper into like what to trying to kind of potentially visually answer that a little bit more. And ultimately, in the end, I really wanted to focus on their relationship and how ending it on them and where they're at in the emotionally and physically uh, having been in this situation was ultimately what I wanted to focus on in turn, as opposed to kind of solving everyone's big questions about why is this actually happening? So just to focus on the emotionality of it, to focus on the couple, to focus on the, the story itself. Did you have a reason why the time loop was happening? Not so much a reason, more like the mechanic, just like the general mechanics of like, see, you know, if I had a lot of money, which again, I decided that it wouldn't have even really, I don't think it would have mattered, but just a, a visual idea of what's actually going on in terms of these kind of loops and all of that but i it, it was just kind of silly there was no reason was there was there ever a version where they get out of the loop no no they were always in there but i do like to think maybe one of them gets out but we're not going to see that <laughs> one of them but not both oh well who no maybe both maybe yeah. both no and it's, and it's just interesting to hear because like sometimes the dynamics of why it's happening and stuff like that are aren't as interesting something even like groundhog day one of yeah. the early versions of the script was that Bill Murray pissed off a woman that was secretly a witch. Like, Oh, really? Yeah, he did a mean interview oh. with her. And wow. she put that curse on him. There really wasn't much done to appease her, to yeah. break the spell, per se, until he turned into a better person. But that was actually something that I really enjoyed about Brightwood, in which it doesn't matter if they're going to be nice to each other and finally get along. Whatever this force is, of nature or the universe is that's trapped them isn't going to let them out just for something that simple. No. You know? So, so it's like, there isn't a resolution there and they have to stay in this kind of purgatory state, which I think is some of the interest and dark charm of the film itself. I like that dark charm, but I think, I think, you know, a lot of that comes with, you know, the comparison to kind of like a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. A lot of those kind of end in that kind of way. And I think that a lot of time loop movies, a lot of them are funny. And I think our movie's very funny and has kind of an absurdist quality to it. But I, I knew that if I could land that and hit that ending, that's what I always, always wanted. I think one of the funniest things is to watch it with a big audience because the film really is fun to watch in a the theater. There are some 
vocal Aww. at the end of the film when she puts her head on the, you know, and I right. get like, oh man, I, so I've, I've somehow got it where they're eating each other and I get, oh, this is great. <laughs> that makes sense. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine. And we just published our newest issue, issue 49.5. It has a bunch of amazing Emmy coverage, but I'm going to get back to that in a second because first I want to thank our sponsor. So Emmy voting is currently underway. It's still open. And I want our Emmy voting podcast listeners out there to remember, for your consideration, please keep in mind The Daily Show. You know, The Daily Show is the show the New York Times called, quote, a beloved institution. You know, it's also nominated for three Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Talk Series. Of course, host Trevor Noah helped us make sense of and laugh at a nonsensical and not so fun world. And he did it every Every single night, four nights a week, 52 weeks a year, except for when he didn't because of holidays and stuff. The Washington Post called Trevor, quote, a late night comedy unicorn. And we all know how rare unicorns are. They're pretty much extinct. So remember, he didn't do it for the awards. But come on. If you're not still convinced, you can learn more about The Daily Show over at ParamountFYC.com. That's ParamountFYC.com. Com. Now, as for Backstory's Emmy issue, folks, it really is awesome because it is packed with a bunch of really cool shows that we absolutely love, including The Mandalorian, Ted Lasso, Obi-Wan Kenobi, The Bear, Better Call Saul, Weird, The Al Yankovic Story, and Prey. And please keep in mind that Backstory Magazine and the Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast fully support the WGA and SAG After Strike, and all interviews were conducted within the proper guidelines for those guilds. So what it really means is if you're reading an interview with a screenwriter in it, it means that we had conducted it pre-strike. Otherwise, for the interviews that we did for these Emmy-nominated shows during the strike, we chose to instead interview directors, editors, and even a cinematographer because they're storytellers too. And their work really shines this year. So I hope you'll check it out. And there's plenty of other stuff in issue 49.5. Literally everything we've published since our Oscar issue is in there. It is a full issue. Don't be uh, confused by the 0.5. We just couldn't in our right minds publish issue 50, which we're really looking forward to doing until the strike's over because we want screenwriters in it without any restrictions. So I do hope that you will check our site in the coming weeks or months, depending on how long the strike goes, because anything new that we publish and we're going to keep publishing will be within the proper guidelines, but it will be added to issue 49.5 until the strike is over. If you've never read us before, you could check out our free issue on a desktop or laptop over at Backstory.net, or you could read us on our iPad app, Backstory. And if you'd like to become a subscriber and support independent film journalism, and I hope you do, I'd like to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. So you could even see us talking on a Zoom. It would really mean a lot to me to have you as a subscriber. So thanks for considering. But now without any further ado, let's jump right back into our conversation with writer-director Dane L. Carr about his feature debut, Brightwood, which you could watch on VOD and DVD. I'm curious about where the act breaks fall for you. It seems like maybe the end of act one is like the I second think... time loop or finding the headphones. It's not like when he's run into by a future self. I think I had the second act start to when they started to actually go into the woods. I think I had it someplace until they kind of like decided, oh, we're going to go into the woods. And then once they're in the woods, they kind of have a breakup scene. And that's the kind of start of the the, the second act, in my opinion, because then you take that until we get to where they uh, essentially it's a new couple and that's kind of like i think the start of like the uh, the third act and then the climax of course is what happens with them the, the cannibalistic couple you're talking about yeah you know so keeping track of things in a time loop is a challenge and you're not really using a set here other than nature you had mm. your swimming sign that you know as a marker that they kept coming back to but it was really you know tokens you know the the props so the iconography of the blue hoodie that you know is weathered damaged muddied in the future mm. and i'm just curious kind of 
how you played with that idea, both on the page, but also on the screen, because you got really creative. I mean, not only does the hoodie, it's used by both of them. It's dark. You know, it's it's a little scary looking when you're seeing it from the distance. And you can't see who's wearing it because their back is to them. But you mm-hmm. also, by the end, you're turning it into a tent that is mm-hmm. laced together with, you know, the earbud. headphones. Yeah, the earbud headphones wiring which was the other first piece of iconography that you see in which she drops one we see that and then when the scene repeats there's two on the ground so we know that like we're entering a time loop right there so tell us about kind of using those props to let us know the passage of time and how far into the future we're getting well in terms of the sweatshirts that was just a very kind of simple wardrobe choice of what would happen if you were stuck in daylight for hours and then what, you know, so it was, came from a very practical, like, okay, well, you, you see those sweatshirts that are sun stained and kind of off orange. And so it started very simply and, and practically. And then it was, what are the simplest things in, because I'm thinking budget here as well. What are the simplest things that I can give these characters that will allow me to use as tools to kind of show these, these passages of time? And so, yeah, earbuds, you can buy a packet of earbuds for like, you know, buy 50 earbuds for 50 bucks or something like that. So it just, it it was a practical thing. It was a, it was a budgetary decision, but it works so perfectly into the script as well. And like the, the phones that they discover and, and all of that. And then the idea that they have that couple in terms of a act transition too, that once we're now with this kind of new couple, that they're both wearing a blue sweatshirt. So it adds to this kind of, these are new people both visually they're not the same people that were there before the props are multiplying yeah and 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 what was also interesting about the time loop structure was that rather than a complete verbatim repeat you started edging out and i I don't know if that puts it into like a multiverse concept but like things were actually not repeating as we'd originally saw them they were they were changing especially when you see the the couple watching themselves before they're completely full cannibals but they're trying to trick each other like kind of some of the early kills right they're trying right, to right, trick right, each right. other down the wrong road so they could easily kill them so that that was kind of interesting too what what gave you that idea to not do the verbatim repeat and to kind right. of get a bit more into chaos well i kind of wanted to i wanted to step away from that especially once we're entering in there's a scene where one dan you know kind of goes around the corner i mean this this is obviously a big spoiler but uh there once jen is killed the dan goes around the corner and we meet another jen, uh, another jen that is really the only time where things kind of start to over uh, uh, to kind of repeat themselves because i had them do a very similar scene over again in a different way but now the stakes are completely completely different. And now I'm visually aesthetically taking all of my shots and I switched it around to the other side of these couples. And so once we get to a certain point, we start to see that, oh, they're doing the same thing, but they're messing up. And then once they get to another point in the film and we're actually introduced to a totally different couple, now we know, oh, well, this isn't going to happen in the same way. And what I wanted to kind of play with is just kind of, in essence, the reality of time is, is that we do have this kind of free will, supposedly, and the, making these choices. And in time as humans, it's not as simple as just making good or bad choices. But these are the things that w- we have. And certainly th- in the realm of these characters presented in different situations, yeah, they're going to make different different decisions and different choices. And I was fascinated by that. It was refreshing to see that it wasn't just like a complete repeat loop. Yeah. of everything and, and that yeah. the loop could spin out of control as these characters lives do as well which i thought was good well i think ultimately what leads you to the end is that 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 couple you know chose to do what they're doing you know and to maybe under they that they've been there for so long they have a much better understanding of what they have to do to survive and so to be in survival mode as a couple you know they they figured out the game and can hunt hunt themselves down and that's their choice you know that's what allows them to live i I guess you know one of the times that i noticed you were fooling around with your footage was when you had stuff shot what on what seemed to be an iPhone Mm -hmm. using actual iPhone footage, or were you kind of doing something with your color gradation? And no, I used, uh, I love using different, different medium, different cameras if I can. So majority was shot on the Sony. And then, you know, when I had them kind of start uh, kind of walking around, seeing if they had service, then I shot that through the iPhone itself. 
And then there were certain other instances, which I used an iPhone as well, just for practical purposes. When she's in the water, that's all an iPhone. Just because I didn't, uh, I didn't want to take my my camera into the into the water without real real proper housing, and certainly I didn't want to do it while we were actually filming. Later, I did go out and get some underwater shots. So. I mean, you could have gone crazy on how far you were going into the cannibalism. You know, you were kind of just going for the classy version. You know, blood splatters here and there, sure. and meat on the ground. What, yeah. what were some of the other things that you wanted to accomplish, but maybe you couldn't have with the cannibalism or did you get it the way you wanted it? It was always just a little bit more. I had more guts. I had l- more gore. I had more blood. But in the editing process, which was a long, which was a long process, I just kind of felt like it didn't need to go that far. It was about reaching that fine line where it, I felt that we were able to kind of get it, get it right. You actually I shot had- gore your stuff and you you cut it down in editing oh yeah 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 we shot there was a whole gut pile there was just a lot of blood there was a lot of stuff i you you, know i love that stuff it it just it wasn't work in terms of uh, the time and the again you cut for the emotionality of it so i would rather have you land where some people say ah than to land when people are like oh you know say it it just those were just the little choices that that we made that makes sense but i mean we've been dancing around it we've got to talk about it now editing is the last stage of storytelling and you You are also the editor of the film. So tell us about your experience editing. And was there ever a danger of not being able to see the the forest for the trees by being too into it? Or did it work to your advantage? I mean, I think that I do love editing. I really do believe it. I mean, it certainly is the last stage of of the of the storytelling process. I think having it be my first feature film and having done so much and taken on so many responsibilities in terms of the actual shooting of it, when I got to actually sit down and edit it, it was like <laughs> it was like a, a, an emotional reckoning with all of this stuff that you you know, directing is kind of like you're jumping out of the plane. You just gotta you're taking it as it goes and making these really quick decisions. And so now you you have to reckon with all this information that you have and that you've captured the only way you do that is you just kind of start doing it and start watching and the first scenes that you start putting together you you just like i remember just feeling this incredible sense of dread how i i like i can't believe i made this but you know then you start cutting away a little bit and turning things around and and realizing how you can maybe fix some stuff and every step of the way in the editing process was a little bit like that you know my editor didn't like my director very much but uh yeah i was going to say like did you get yeah. the coverage that you needed for the edit or was there was there ever a chance that you were going to go do a pickup shot of anything no i would went back and got b-roll so i could go back and kind of film if i needed to get some more of the forest or something like that right. but in terms of we shot that i didn't have to go back and shoot them at all it, it came together where if I, it was just a frame longer in some of those things they would be like something would have happened something happens so it really was like it just seemed to come together and work and it was amazing Obviously, you were talking a second ago about using nature, and it's a good cutaway, right? Like it's it's mm-hmm. something that editors do, having the yeah. drone shot, and you had drone shots in there. And was was that something that was hard to do, by the way, or was that another thing that was you did yourself? No, Lester Pernala, who is also our sound uh, onset sound mixer, he had a drone, and that was a little 4K drone, and so we went out and he did some of those, or he did he shot all of the drone shots. Uh, drone footage and i was just there with him all of the b-roll you know i went out i either went out with max or with a friend and just kind of you know, shot i i would go out and kind of again watch the light see if something interesting would come up did those kind of rashomon shots of the the forest canopy through the sunlight because i knew yeah as an editor if you can if you need to cut out of something or fix something that the yeah get a lot of b-roll what, what were some deleted scenes was there anything that was big for character or narrative? Yeah, our first cut of the film was probably 15 minutes longer. Which Talk is, us again, through it. What was in it? Kind of incredible. It's nothing major. It's a lot of little instances. Like there was Dan falling down a hill and then Jen, of course, being Jen, gracefully makes her way down the hill and, and then kind of helps him up. And it's about this like, you know, little two or three minute scene, but it just ended up not working in terms of the pacing. And so there was all these little things like that that just did, ended up not needing to be in the film you know you go around the trash can again and then we decide oh well, we don't really need to see that again that kind of stuff so there was really no big deleted scene hill was the major one okay um, then oh, what we did too is that which made it a little bit longer one of the things that made the, the first cut longer is that all of those b-roll shots or all of those scenes i would just stay on them a little bit longer and a lot of the editing process was kind of like just cutting all of that honing it all down you don't need to sit, stay in a tree for 
45 seconds. No. They can be 10 seconds or five seconds. So that makes sense. Uh, you yeah. know, one of the times when a future self was coming to kill, there was like a blindfold on. And I'm curious what that was about for you. Right. Yeah. It was a piece of cloth. Over, well, again, it was kind of like if you're in the sunlight the whole time. And also, I think these people, like I say, they don't really know. But there's also this is the fir first time I've talked about this. So that is an actual mask that you see it's out of focus but what i did is i made a mask of an old version of max and i put the blindfold on and you could put the hood over it and it allowed me to have if i needed a stand-in with like if i needed my assistant to put on the mask and max over here i could still have that over you know do the shot over here and and so it just worked out perfectly i didn't have to put him in an old in old makeup for a two second shot, you know, in the woods, I could just pop on this mask and it worked really well. Old school mask making too. It was just uh latex and tissue and f all of that stuff. It worked. I mean, and, and, you know, his face is so dirty that it, that it works, but was the concept of the blindfold that there were slits cut in it to try mm -hmm. to act like you weird glasses? Or yeah, or... exactly. Yeah. Okay, but I couldn't tell if somebody's eyes had been gorged out and they were sensing their way around if that was it. So, well, it all kind of works. I think in, at least in my head for the right. kind of mysteriousness of this, of this figure that ending i want to talk about because they've successfully been cannibalizing each other for quite a while yeah and this couple that couldn't get along you see them after one of their kills leaning on each other kind mm -hmm. of like a genteel old couple yeah you know just yeah. just happy at the end of the day but in this case it's end of the day kill and yeah. you know eat, eating themselves I'm curious what some of the other endings were that you might have played with, or or was that really always it? No, that was really always it. And in, in my script, it I think it I I think it I, I can't remember what it actually said, but I think it said like something to that extent. Like, and they sit, Je, you know, Jen's shoulder a head on his shoulder, like a couple that has been together for a long time. That so that was always the ending. Yeah. What was your toughest scene? What was your toughest scene on the page? And what was your toughest scene? to shoot and how did you creatively rise to the challenge so breakups are always really hard and you don't and you and especially that opening act where you have this couple that could potentially are just a bickering fighting couple and so i really wanted to infuse the like some of these scenes with humor i remember working on the breakup scene for quite a bit just what can we make it funny dark you know, really dig in there and also, you know, not not overstay our welcome. And so that was one of the scenes we worked a, 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 really, a lot on. I would say the hardest scene, though, in terms of the writing and just conceptually as a director speaking to the actors about how we were going to do it was that scene where essentially it's the repeat of the scene that you had where Dan has just run into the new gen and that they're going to play out that scene again and almost say the same things because the stakes are so different, just playing with the actors. And then it wasn't until they actually got on set when they visually knew, oh, I'm actually going to be filming it from a different perspective now. And this is what it can feel like now. And this is the emotionality that that, the, that Max can have. Then it really started to play together. I think on the page, it just seemed like we were playing the same scene over again uh, with slightly different stakes. But in the actual filming of it, it really starts to become a much more alive and, and different and kind of eerie and strange. So we spent a lot of time on that. What was the happy accident of filming? What was something that all the planning in the world couldn't have planned for, but that worked out just the weather. It only rained maybe twice. I mean, could you imagine? I, I like you, yeah, you stuff, like I, every day was a panic attack of like, okay, just I'm going to look at the weather app now because <laughs> you just never know. I mean, it's, it's New Jersey. It rains all the time. I mean, who, who what knows? would you have done? I mean, I guess in the context of a, of a chaotic time loop, random rain isn't the worst thing in the world is that no i mean i think we would have probably figured, if it was really raining i think we talked about you, you, that we would maybe incorporate it in somehow it, i don't think it would have been the end of the world but the weather ended up working out really well though there were a lot of bugs filming out there the kind of happy accident was the planning that we did allowed us to have more time. And there was a, a scene where she's on the island kind of going up to this kind of unknown object. And I filmed the whole thing and I got home and I started looking at what we filmed and I hated it. I thought the thing looked horrible. And so again, having all of this planning that we did and realizing that we actually had more time, I was able to actually go reshoot that entire scene. I threw it out of focus and when I went in. you say object, what are you talking about? Yeah, that little orb 
at the orb at the end, the little ball that she oh, kind of, or the mirrored image that's yes. there. Again, it's about the, so I, the first time I filmed it, you see a lot more of it. And I, then I started saying, okay, this is a, this does not work. And so we went back and I really honed. I'm glad it. you reminded me of that. Did, did you yeah. want to define that? Because I know that some people could look at it as again, in a twilight zone type of sense, like monsters are due on Maple street, right? The right, right, concept right. of aliens watching us and we're just their play to toys and stuff like that was was there any definition you wanted to give the orb what i knew is i wanted it to be a reflection and i knew that i wanted it to have an appearance that an answer would probably happen but i again always knew that the person that was going to whack her in the head was going to be an older version of herself so i love the idea that it has it's an, a kind of completion the movie completes i know there's inevitably going to be people that are want more answers yeah. but i think if you take the movie as it is it really does have a kind of satisfying ending to it so i never I never really wanted to answer it that much. However, I've had people say, oh, well, they're clearly in purgatory. This is some sort of purgatory thing. And then I've had people say it's some sort of alien orb. My favorite one is, you know, like in heavy metal. Yeah. And this was not my mind at all. There is that orb that like travels yeah. around. So like someone said, is it, is it like that? And it yeah, fell. And, just, and I was like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> I mean, the thing that cracked me up is she's just about to do something with it and she's yeah. killed. Yeah, and like yeah. it could mean that just the fact that the older version is killing the younger version, who knows? It could be something that would have liberated her from the time loop. Yeah, the of course. That but could have been it. Yeah. But she's killed by, you know, a cannibalistic older version of herself that is probably unaware of it even being there. And, sure. You know, yeah. has no interest in it if, if they've yeah. seen it. So that was interesting too. Well, this is the point at which I would usually ask what's next, but being in the middle <laughs> of the strike, there's nothing anybody's working on. Yeah, we're all kind of on hold, but I think again, I think it's important and and it'll 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 be resolved. And I I think absolutely I think the studios will fold. So. I, I, I hope they fold and I hope they do it soon. But uh look, you've been very generous with your time and I thank you for chatting about this, your first film, and congrats to you for getting it in the can. Dane, thanks again for chatting with us today. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been great. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to writer-director Dane L. Carr for being so generous with his time and coming down to chat about his debut feature film, Brightwood, which you could watch on DVD and VOD. Of course, I would also like to thank today's sponsor, The Daily Show. They've been nominated for three Emmys, so as Emmy voting is still open, we hope that you will continue to consider The Daily Show, and you can learn more about The Daily Show over at ParamountFYC.com. And folks, speaking of Emmys, yes, Backstory Magazine published issue 49.5, and the way that we did it during the strike is it is packed with great Emmy articles that we are very proud of, ranging from The Mandalorian to Ted Lasso, Obi-Wan Kenobi, The Bear, Better Call Saul, Weird, The Al Yankovic Story, and Prey. And we did it during the strike following all the proper guidelines. If you're reading an article with a screenwriter or listening to a podcast with a screenwriter, it means that it was conducted before the strike in these cases. And if you are reading something that has a director, editor, or cinematographer, it means this is how we chose to cover these shows during the strike because directors, editors, and cinematographers are storytellers too, and vital parts of the crew and vital parts of what make these shows so great. So we were still happy to cover these shows that we love and do it within all the guidelines to keep everything copacetic. And as I've said before, we're going to keep putting new articles into issue 49.5, which has everything we've published since our Oscar issue. So there's a lot of great stuff in there. And you could check out the table of contents to see what's inside over at Backstory.net. Now, if you've never read us before, you could check out a free issue of Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. Or you could even read us in the Backstory iPad app. And of course, it would be awesome if my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and the Zoomcast watchers of this Zoomcast, where all these Zooms go, and you could watch us over on YouTube at the Backstory Magazine page. It would be amazing to see you show support for Backstory Magazine and independent film journalism by becoming a subscriber. And to sweeten the deal, I'm here to give you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. So thanks again for considering supporting my passion project. You'll be happy that you did.
The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2023, all rights reserved. Folks, if you ever want to reach out to me, you could find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. You could use those same handles over on Instagram, Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page. You could also send in an email to BackstoryLetters at gmail.com and I'll do my darndest to respond wherever you reach out. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.